Good afternoon, everyone. So, um, so as Wei mentioned, uh, uh, we give this tutorial a lot with Alex before. Uh, I'm just giving the whole talk today. So bef before I start, I just want to acknowledge a bunch of people who actually contributed to a lot of the work that I will present today. And uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime during the talk, ask questions. Uh, I know the people here have different backgrounds, so uh, we'll try to go uh, as much detail as the time permit, but if something is, is really uh, not obvious, you stop, stop me and just ask a question, we'll go over the board. Uh, if, if everything is, if you guys are silent, I'll assume you understand everything. So it's your advantage to stop me. So what I will try to cover today is, uh, we'll look at big data, we we'll understand like what big data mean in, in industrial setting, which is what I work on. Uh, and then uh, we'll look at different problems that arise uh, when you work in industrial setting like Google or, or Yahoo. And then we'll look at what are the patterns to scale machine learning models uh, to that uh, data set. And uh, I'll cover a lot of techniques today. Some of them are graphical models. Uh, some of them are uh, optimizations. So uh, some of them are a lot to what you guys will take like two days from now. Uh, what I really care about today is, is focusing on uh, the pattern or the template for distributed data analysis. And the, it, it will show us for the talk. OK, so first, like, let's first calibration, because uh, everyone says big data. But when we mean big data, people mean different things. Uh, when I was grad school, if I was working with 10,000, 20,000, this was big data for me. But just to have calibration today about uh, what is the sizes that we're talking about. So if you have, when we talk about tiny data, we talk probably about your phone, it has two cores, probably have half gigs RAM, uh, processor with 50 megaflops, probably can process like in this scale 1,000 examples. Okay. Uh, if you go a little bit big and we talk about your laptop, has four cores, has four gigabyte of RAM, you probably can process like 100 examples in this. And if you go a bit fancier and you have a desktop which has 16 cores, here's two gigabytes, uh, you probably can process data on the size medium scale of about 100, 1, 1 million example. And then if you go a bit fancier and you have uh, you have a bunch of server or a bunch of clusters, uh, for example, you might have up to two, five, six cores, a half terabyte of RAM, uh, one teraflop of operation per second. And in this scale, you can process probably up to 100 million example. Uh, what I'm talking today is actually falls from here and going down which is massive scales where you have billion of examples, billion of features, things doesn't fit in memory. And we'll talk about techniques like how we can deal with this large and the massive. So that's what I mean by big data today. Okay. Okay, and uh, if I say like 100 millions or billions, this is actually not an uh, exaggeration because here is, uh, this is an info chart. Uh, it tells you in industry what we get like for every minute, you have about, uh, you can read the number, you have 48 hours worth of YouTube uploaded every minute. Okay, that's huge, that's big. You have uh, in Instagram, you have user share three, almost 4,000 photos every, every minute and so on. This is the scale of the data that we need to deal with. And another aspect that you will see here is that data is dynamic. It's coming every minute you have larger scale of the data and you are required to process this data and serve it to the user. And most of this data actually at that scale is user generated content as you see and it's everywhere from Facebook, Flickr, Twitter and so on. And example of this data, I'm not gonna read all of this but just to give you an idea like uh, web pages, so you need to crawl the web, you need to learn the web graph, uh, clicks, like who user, which, uh, what are the ads that the user click at, or you have a news feed, which, which news articles the user have clicked at, and so on and so forth. Like for example, uh, Birch's decision, what the user have Birch's, what the user uh, type as an innocent message, and who do you connect to, all of these things are logged and would like to uh, process this. And some of the machine learning problems that arise uh, when we deal with this data is that we can put them in two sides. One of them is supervised and one of them is unsupervised. An example of some of the supervised problems that we deal with in industry is like ads, for example. So, uh, which mean, uh, we call it click prediction, meaning that if I have a user, 
uh, if I know as a history of the user and if I have an ad, I want to predict if I show this ad to the user whether the user will click or not. Okay? And actually, this is a very important problem and actually that's why the internet is free for you because someone else is paying for it. And uh, a lot of industrial research going into the modeling the user and trying to uh, model this click prediction problem. Uh, click feedback, for example, uh, what user stories the user have clicked on, uh, emails, you want, for example, to, uh, you can mark some emails as spam and not, and you want to learn a spam model for each user, because what's considered spam for you might be important email for another user. You have tag prediction, uh, for example, in YouTube, you can tag your videos, and now if you have a new videos, you want to learn a model such that, given a new video, I want to recommend some new tags uh, for the user. Uh, location modeling, I want to know where the user goes in real life if you have a phone and the phone has GPS. Uh, I want to understand where the user have been so that we can recommend offer to the user. And also, all of these are kind of uh, classification problem at different scale and different granularity. But most of the data actually exists in a label-free form, which is totally unsupervised. And here actually, while the question here, someone have given you X and Y, X is the data, Y is the label, and you just want to learn the model. Here, you actually just have data and you have to actually first think what question you need to answer first. So for example, you might have graphs that show how the user are connected to each other. What can you do with it? Okay? If, if I have a new user and I don't have any interaction between the user and the website, what, what can I tell from the, from the neighbors that the user interact with? Uh, you have a bunch of document collection and can we apply like some unsupervised technique to understand what are the patterns in this document collection? Uh, and I'll talk about topic models today uh, as a running example for unsupervised techniques. Uh, you have an email discussion and threads, uh, how, I can organize, how I can extract information from that email. For example, if you are using Android now and you get a flight ticket, we parse the emails and we tell you like when your flight and give you a reminder and all of these things. So we need to, need to address that. And no one gave you a label for that. You, are, you actually, not, no one is allowed to look at your emails. So all of this has to be unsupervised techniques. And you have query streams and what question we can ask here, like what, what word would be popular next? Like, or what is the intensity of a given query at a future time point? So time series analysis. So most of the data is actually unlabeled in the internet and we would like, so just to summarize, as I said, uh, essentially have an infinite amount of data. And labeling is very expensive and sometimes it's not, it's not even possible. Like if I have an email, I can't, have someone look at your email and mark this is as broad as this is as flight. So the technique has to be unsupervised. And uh, what we need actually, we need to understand the structure in the data and uh, we need to rely on, on, on unlabeled technique, unsupervised technique to, under, to extract pattern from this data. And today actually we'll, we'll cover a bit of building block about, we'll look at some problems, how to scale them and probably in this process you will learn a little bit about uh, what does it take to work at that scale. Okay, so I talk a little bit about the data size. I'll talk now about a little bit about the hardware uh, quickly. So you, you might think that uh, we have very high performance computing, you have very library cluster, but the problem is that at Google or at Yahoo or at Facebook or in industry with that kind of scale, you really can't assume that you, you get a high performance computer. You have a very big machine, powerful, it doesn't fail, it's always running, that's not the case. The hardware actually that work with an industry is actually what we call commodity hardware, which meaning actually it's cheap, uh, it's easy to replicate, but it's very unreliable, okay? And we actually have to deal with it. So what I'm telling you here is that we don't have fancy machine in industry, meaning that you don't assume that machine fail, but machine always fail all the time, and you have to deal that at an algorithmic level. So your algorithm should be robust to these failures. Uh, this is just a slide from uh, Jeff Dean, who is like famous computer <coughs> science at Google. Uh, he's a system researcher. So he's just giving you an idea about what is the range of failure. Uh, I'm not going to go over all of this, but this is the range of failure that you can experience over a given cluster and how much the expected downtime for machines. For example, you might have overheating and you lose like one or two days to recover. You might have uh, power failure and you lose like thousand machines for six hours, all of these things can happen. And our algorithm has to be robust to these things as well. Uh, you might have some something like network maintenance, so it might reduce the bandwidth. So you need to deal with that if your algorithm actually exchanging information over the net and so on. So 
So in general, uh, we have lots of machine, each machine have lots of code, but they are unreliable, and we have big data, lots of data, and we want to build techniques that can uh, use many cores inside the same machine and use many machines simultaneously and is robust to failure in, the, in these machines. Okay. Okay. So, how many of you heard about MapReduce? Okay. Great. So, most people think that whenever you say big data and industry, the first thing that come to mind is MapReduce. Like you guys are using MapReduce to scale the algorithm. Uh, MapReduce is actually a great system. But uh, just for people who don't know what's MapReduce, uh, so if you have a distributed computation problem, the programming paradigm for MapReduce is that you have lots of faulty machines, and uh, you have lots of job which actually inversely parallel. And the way the programming model works is that you have your data to the input list, and you apply, the data has key and value. You have a map function, and this map function take key and value and produce one or more key or values based on this record. And I'll give you an example now. And these, these new key and values are fed to something called reducer, which aggregates this and produces your out. That's MapReduce. Okay. So, so one famous example is that in the map phase, the input might be the key is the document ID, and the value of the key might be the words in the document. And the mapper function just emit for each word how many times it appears in each document. Okay. So you're given one key value, produce multiple key values of each word appear in this document and out the account. And then in the reduce phase, you sum all of these keys to get at the end how many times each word appear in the whole corpus. Okay? That's a very standard application of MapReduce. Okay? So it's a great system. If your problem fits actually MapReduce, that's great. But, and this is actually how it works in practice, and as you see actually the good thing here is that you have the data and you split the data into multiple batches. Each worker is a member. Uh, it gets a bunch of the data. So the good thing here is that if thing is fails, uh, you can replace it easily. So the, the programming model actually can deal with failure automatically. Uh, and then you produce the output from the map, reduce from the map phase into the disk. So all communication occurs through the disk. And then in the reduce phase, you read from disk, and then you sum them or do the other operation. to, to uh, You have a key and a bunch of values. You produce a value for a given key. And you have the output files. So the good thing here is that it's, it's, uh, it's fault tolerant because everything happens through the disk. So if a reducer fails, it just can go and read from the disk. Same thing, if a member fails the data in the disk and the output in the disk, you just can replicate that. So it's very, it's very good if your problem fits into MapReduce. But most of the time when we deal with machine learning, uh, our problem actually does not fit. If you have a small round of MapReduce, that's good. Why? Because communication happens through the disk. The disk is actually very slow. Okay, so if you want to have an iterative machine learning algorithms which actually communicate terabyte of data, and for each round of MapReduce, you want to produce this data and put it in disk, and then read it from the reducer and have the output, and then iterate this like 1,000 times if you are doing gap sampling like what I showed you today, then this paradigm becomes a bit inefficient for this case. Okay, so MapReduce is great if your problem fits in this paradigm, if probably you have a few small MapReduce iteration needed, but if you have iterative machine learning, where you actually don't want to communicate information via I.O., and then MapReduce might not be the best, best option, and I'll talk, uh, talk today about architectures that we designed to deal with these situations. Okay? Another thing about MapReduce is that there is no state information between iterations, so if you have the state of your GIF sampler, for example, and you finish one MapReduce, when you start the next MapReduce, you have to start from scratch. So you lose the state across uh, iterations. Okay, so, so I'll talk now about one back machine learning. Okay, that's as far as system as goes in this talk. Uh, so we'll take one example of a graphical model called topic models. Uh, we'll use it as a running example today, and we'll see like what is a graphical model look like, what are the challenges to apply this at a large scale, and uh, we we'll take it from start to end. Okay. So before talking to topic model, let's talk about a similar model about clustering. Uh, here's a bunch of with pages, and we want to cluster them. Okay, so for example, you have some web pages about airlines, some web pages about universities, and some web pages about restaurants. It's a very easy problem. Uh, how many, how many one here doesn't know clustering? Okay, so everyone knows clustering. Great. So just to establish limitation, the graphical model here, uh, when we mean by clustering, we mean it's, it's also called mixture model, and the reason it's called mixture model 
is that uh, you have a bunch of data points. Uh, for each data point, you observe some data. For example, in documents, that might be a vector of words, that appearance document. And then you have, for example, let's say Gaussian, for example, this would be a 2D bind. And then you have a set of clusters, and each cluster has a mean and covariance. Okay? And the generative process is very easy. You first have a prior distribution over clusters. To generate your data, you sample a label for each data point from this prior distribution. And condition on this label, you sample the data from uh, the selected cluster distribution uh, simplified by mu k and sigma k if this y i equal k, for example. Okay? And this is the graphical model. This is the observed data. This is the hidden variable, and this is your parameter. Based on whether you are Bayesian or frequency, you do map or you do collapse gift sampling. I will talk about that today. Okay? So that clustering is a very simple model. Uh, and this is a joint probability distribution, which I think in the morning you have seen a lot of these things. So joint probability distribution between the x and y is just uh, the probability of x given y times the probability of y given uh, given theta. And uh, if we have a clustering distribution, then theta would be from multinomial, and the emission model depends on, on, on the nature of x. Here it's just a Gaussian distribution. Okay. We can cluster a lot of things. We can cluster user, we can cluster queries, we can cluster URLs, uh, mails, spam, abuse, lots of things. Okay, so now back to motivate topic models, which we called mixed membership models for a good reason. So again, you have our uh, web pages again, and now we can cluster them uh, in different ways. For example, I can cluster them saying I have, as before, airlines, universities, and restaurants. This is one clustering. But I can also cluster them in different ways. I say this is USA web pages, this is Australian web pages, and this is Singaporean web pages, right? And which one is good? So they cluster them by the category of the web page or ways the countries. You don't know, right? So what you actually want is that you want something slightly more specific. You say this is US Airlines, this is Australian University. This is Singaporean airline, this is Singaporean food restaurant, and so on. So in this case, you assign to each web page not only a single cluster, but multiple clusters. And that's why we call this model mixed membership models. So mixed membership models, it means that each object actually does not belong to one cluster, but it belongs to multiple clusters. It exhibits different properties. Okay? And that's why we call mixed membership models. And clustering, we call it mixture models, because the object is generated from a single cluster. Okay, so how we do that, and this is like just cartoonish view about the difference between uh, topic models and clustering. Uh, this is Zabro built symbolics, uh, which is a space of points that sums to one. And in clustering, you just take a data point and you stick it to one of the clusters. So you have to approximate which cluster is closest to it. Okay, but in topic models, you have again you have the symbolics and you have three dimensions of the symbolics. Let's say you have these three color: red, green, and blue. And now you present each other color or object uh, as a continuum, as a distribution over these three colors. For example, the gray will be in the middle. It's like half third in each one. Uh, and this one is between green and red and so on. Okay? So each object actually is a distribution over your clusters. If your cluster are colors, and if your object has another color, then uh, that's uh, how you can visualize the difference between clustering and mixed membership models. Okay, so for the generative process, so back to document. So here is clustering. Uh, here is, this is a prior distribution over, uh, this is a cluster probability distribution. This, uh, we have a prior distribution over it, and you have the data, and you have the cluster label. To get to one topic model, which is called latent racial allocation. Uh, how many have heard about LDA before, understand it? Okay, quite a few, good. Uh, so in this case, actually, if you, if you notice the similarity here, I just take this part and put it a red box around it, which means that for a given document, you want to cluster the words inside this document into topics, okay? And you get the topic distribution inside this document, and then you still have a topic label for each, for each word that appear inside the document. And we call this mixed membership model because in this cluster, in this data point, it has, it belongs, as said before, to one label, and the data is generated from that cluster, but here, the generative process, you first generate a distribution over the clusters for this document from a given prior. Usually, we take it as a tertiary distribution. And then for each data point, for each word in the document, you sample a cluster label, or we call it a topic label, from that distribution. And then you generate 
uh, this word from uh, that topic distribution over the vocabulary. And that's why it's called mixed, because different words can come from different topics, but they still appear in the same document, so we want this topic distribution to be sparse so that like few, few topics appear in each document. Okay? Uh, another way to differentiate between to both this clustering and topic model into a unified view, you can look at it as matrix multiplication. So you have a cluster or topic is a distribution, or so each row is a cluster or topic, and each column is a feature, like word. And each cluster or a topic has a distribution over the vocabulary. And now you have document by cluster matrix, which give you the membership. And if you multiply these two things, you get the document word matrix, okay? So the difference here is that in clustering, the membership is zero and one. So it's a vector, which all zero, but only one adds a cluster which this document belongs to. In topic model, it's a stochastic matrix, which means for each document, you have a distribution over the cluster, which sum to one, okay? And if you have heard about LSI, you just, again, it, it's not zero one, it's not stochastic, but still like arbitrary entries inside this, okay? So by having different constraint on the membership of the document to clusters, you can have different, different models. The good thing about topic models, it have a generative semantic, so you can actually take it at building block and, and have a lot of cool things on top of it, which we'll cover today. So here's an example if you apply a topic model to a, a text document. Uh, you, can, you should be able to label uh, each word in the corpus as coming from different topic. And uh, the color here denote the topic where the word come from. And here's an example of the topic that you get. So each topic is just, or we call it cluster as well, it's just a unigram distribution over the vocabulary. This is, for example, uh, arts. This is a word from, uh, this is topic about arts, this topic about budget, this topic about children, uh, and this topic about education. And you can see the words here, school, student, school, and so on. And this label, actually, we just look at the topic and we invent this label, but there are techniques which actually look at the topics, look at where each topic appears document, and try to come, actually, with a phrase that describes this topic from the document itself. Uh, I won't talk about that now, but if you are interested, you can ask me in the break and I can tell you more about that. Okay. So before going into a bit more detail about uh, topic model, generative process, and the mass, I just take a bit of a side to talk about the Dirichlet distribution. Uh, how, many when, uh, how many of you know the Dirichlet distribution? Good, okay. So the Dirichlet distribution is uh, a distribution over a simplex. And as I said before, the simplex is a space of points that sum to one. So a sample from a Dirichlet distribution uh, is a vector that sum to one. So for example, uh, when you uh, sample from a Dirichlet distribution, get a point theta. And as the, point, as the name implies, theta will give you a distribution, which is a multinomial vector. And uh, the Dirichlet distribution form takes this, the BDF takes this form, uh, which alpha is a vector will give you the prior distribution over a given component of this multinomial distribution. And this is the gamma function. And this form actually, uh, when you sample from it, you want to understand the rules that alpha plays because that's actually very important. So, so alpha controls the shape of the distribution. So first thing that we need to ask about any distribution, what is the expectation, what is the mean, so what is the expected value that uh, theta i uh, takes, and this actually, fair assembly, is just alpha i proportional over the sum of those alpha. So the probability of that you observe a given component, high or low, depends on how big alpha i is, okay? But since this is actually scale invariant, so I can multiply all the alphas by any constant, and you still get the same expectations, right? So now the value of alpha will control the variance, will control, if you sample theta from this distribution, how variance you expect to see around this expectation. And to understand this, let's take a couple of uh, draws. So this is alpha equal one, like you have a vector of all ones, and let's say you have one, two, three, four, five, you have 10 components, okay? So you have a topic model over 10 topics, and each sample from a Dirichlet distribution is a distribution by itself. It's a multinomial vector, which is another distribution over the topics. So I have here like 15 samples from a Dirichlet distribution with all ones, so you have like 10 ones, like alpha equal one, uh, and as you can see, uh, the distribution looks like, how you think it looks like? Looks a bit more like, it's still dense, like everything appears, but with different probability. So let's take it to the extreme, let's put alpha equal 100, so you have vector of length 10, alpha equal 100 from alpha equal 1 to 10, 
And if you sample, what you get? You get almost a uniform distribution over, over the total. Okay? So if we go the other side, like again, back to alpha equal one, which is behavior, if I put alpha equal 0.1, what we expect? We expect that the samples, it will be more sparse. Okay? So in this case, each vector will put its mass over one topics, and the remaining topic will be smaller. Okay? And if we even go further and put alpha equal 0.01, you see like the multinomials that we are sampling from, uh, from this data distribution are actually very sparse. Uh, and it means that it puts all of its mass over one topic only. So if you want to put a Dresher distribution as prior over the document topic vector, which alpha you prefer? Smaller alpha or big alpha? Yes, I'm on top. Raise your voice. Smaller alpha. Why? Because our intuition is that each document only addresses a few topics. So I want imply this as a prior. And this is actually one important building block in, in Bayesian modeling is that you want a prior to model your intuition about how the data is generated. And our, our intuition here is that uh, uh, the document uh, topic relationship is sparse. Each document only talk about one or two topics, so we want to encode that in the prior. And one way of encoding that is to try to always work with alpha equal point one, smaller value of alpha. Okay, so back move to the digital distribution. So this is uh, the functional form of the digital distribution. Uh, one important thing is that uh, the duration distribution is conjugate to the multinomial distribution. Uh, did you cover conjugacy in the morning? Conjugate distribution, how many one knows about conjugate distribution? Okay, what we mean by conjugate distribution is that uh, if I sample theta, which is a multinomial vector from alpha, so it has a duration distribution, and now you can sample different count, different observation from, from this theta. So for example, I sample a topic vector from, a, from alpha, this is a document topic vector, and then for each document I sample a couple of words. Okay? So I have a histogram of x saying how many times I observe topic i in this document. Okay? And then I ask a question, what is the posterior distribution over, over theta? So before seeing any data, theta is distributed as a Drescher distribution, so the mean of theta is just alpha i over sum of alpha i. And when you have a conjugate uh, prior, it means that the posterior is in the same family but with different parameter, which means that the probability distribution over theta, given the prior and given some observation, is it's still a ratio distribution, but with parameter shifted by your observation. Okay? So as you can see here, here we have alpha i, here we have xi plus alpha i. Okay. And why this is useful? Because uh, as I said before, if I ask you what is the expected value of theta, you can look at the prior and tell me it is like alpha i over a sum of alpha i's. If you observe a couple of count from theta, and I ask you what is the posterior distribution of theta now, it will be what is the expected value of theta given that you condition on your observation, and this will be, uh, will be the prior, but shifted by how many time you observe topic i uh, from that multinomial. Okay, and it's very intuitive. And if we have the dimensionality equal to, what's the name of this distribution? Like if, if k equal to, what do you call this? Bernoulli distribution, like it's beta distribution, right? It's beta distribution, and now theta will be a Bernoulli random variable. And actually, if you put alpha equal one, you give you x one plus one over uh, sum of head plus sum of tail plus one plus one. And this, like, uh, we call it Laplace smoothing, if you are familiar with it. If you do coin tossing, that's a standard example. Okay? Okay, so that's a, a quick a quick detour about uh, the Dresch distribution and, and why it's important. Okay, so back to topic models. So now we have our Topic model, again, I go over generative process again. You have, uh, for each document, you have, a bra first you have a set of topics, you have k topics, and each topic, epsi k, is a multinomial distribution. So I want both a prior over, uh, over these multinomials, and in this case, I bought a racial distribution where the precision or the hyperparameter is given by bit. Okay? And we call this a symmetric racial distribution because all the components take the same value with this bit. And as we said before, our intuition tells us that beta should be small because I want every topic to only address few words. Now we have a set of documents and each document has a distribution over the topics. And I put a prior over that, another Dresch distribution with hyperparameter alpha. This can be symmetric or asymmetric. And actually better to be asymmetric so that you have different topics have different expectations. So as I said before, the expected value of the topics is proportional to alpha i. 
So you want a sum topic which are popular to have higher prior probability. So you want this alpha vector to be asymmetric. And once you have, uh, you sample theta i from uh, Dirichlet distribution parameterized by alpha, and once you sample theta i, now you want to generate your data, your words inside the document, for example. So for each word, for the inner box, you sample a topic from this distribution, and then uh, condition on this topic, you sample this word from uh, this topic k distribution over the vocabulary. Okay. And this is a generative model. Okay. Again, called mixed membership model because different parts of the document belong to different, uh, different topics or different mixtures. So if we want to write uh, the joint probability distribution, we have theta, we have z, we have x, and we have epsi, and these are parameters. So joint probability distribution, condition on alpha and beta, we just use uh, chain rule, it's just a probability first, it's a product of all the topics because they are conditionally independent uh, given beta, so it's just a probability of epsi k given k. Uh, again, I, I'm, I'm sure you went over that in the morning, conditional independence and how you can uh, factorize the joint probability distribution into factors. And then you can factor thetas because given a different document, theta i is independent, condition on alpha, so you have a product of probability of theta i given alpha. And then for each word, you just have probability of zi given c because again, the z's inside a given document are independent condition on theta and then you generate xi condition on zi and epsi. Okay, it's very simple. Okay, so we wrote the joint probability distribution and want to perform, uh, perform inference. Uh, you have talked in the morning about Gibbs sampling, so you can apply Gibbs sampling here, right? We can, we can fix everything and then sample epsi, fix everything, sample theta i and so on but that actually will converge very slow. Okay. So one famous algorithm calls uh, collapsing Gibbs sampling, and in collapsing Gibbs sampling, we collapse out continuous variables, and this is actually one of the beautiful things because we have conjugate prior, so we have, uh, if we collapse theta and collapse epsi, we have a joint distribution over z and x. You just have z and x because I collapsed this and collapsed this one, okay? And if we want to write the joint probability distribution, again, it still factorizes, so it's the probability of zi given alpha time the probability of the x's given uh, uh, of the observation given this z. Okay? And now we want to perform Gibbs sampling, and in this case, you, uh, you cover Gibbs sampling in the morning, and as you can see, you fix all the variables, you fix all the z's, and you sample uh, one z condition that everything else is fixed, right? And uh, in this case, uh, sorry, uh, this actually should, so i here goes over uh, the documents and this is the probability of the joint z's because these are not independent when you collapse it, okay? So this is the probability that this is configuration of z given alpha. And this is condition on the z's, xi's are independent given its corresponding z's so you can factorize this way. So just when you look at this, this is just uh, the collection of topic assignment in a given document, we want to see how probable you see this as a vector because they are not independent now. Okay, so I fix all the z's and now I want to sample a given z. So, and this is actually fast. And what we need to know is that what is the probability distribution over a given z that after fixing all the other z's in the collection. And uh, I think I might need to go over this. So this factorize actually into Two parts, the first is that this part, which is the probability uh, of the token or the word given that the topic equal k. And this is just, you can get it easily by looking at uh, the posterior of uh, epsi k. Okay, uh, let me go over the board for this slide. Let's first, uh, let's say you have theta and you have a prior over theta. And then you have a bunch of these. Okay. And now I collapse. So I want to get what is the probability of Z1 equal over Zi equal K. And you have alpha is and so on for theta. Okay. And I want to ask what's the probability of Zi equal K given uh, the other values of these minus I? and alpha. Okay. So the way that you read this, that what's the probability that the, the i's topic equal k given the topic assignment to everything other than i. Okay. 
and you could also condition on all. So you have collapsed out seed. So what is this? It's an easy trick. You, we use something called the total rule, uh, total, rule of, uh, total rule of probability. It's very simple. You just multiply time probability of theta given you say I condition over theta and then integrate it out. Okay? So this will be the probability of the I equal K given Z minus I of and theta times the probability of theta <coughs> given alpha. Okay? So I condition on theta and then integrate it out. I haven't done anything. Right? Okay. So what is this? So this is just, if you look at it, this is, the ex, uh, this is the expected value over the probability of theta, condition on z minus i and alpha to just theta k. Right? Because you have the prior, and you have your uh, stereo, you have your likelihood. And as we said before, if theta is a multinomial distribution, then the posterior of theta would be a Dirichlet distribution with mean equal to a number of time indicator variable that di equal k plus alpha k over summation over alpha i plus Okay, so this is just the posterior distribution over theta, right? So all what we have, we have the prior alpha k. If I ask you what is the probability of theta before that you have seen anything, it's just alpha k over summation of alpha i. But now I observe a couple of words that take the value of k. This is, we call them NTD, which is the number of words that take topol, uh, topic k. Okay, and this is, will be, what's the value of this one? Just n, right? This is the number of words in the document because you summed over everything else over n, right? And that would be the posterior distribution over theta. So now the probability of zi, given all the other words, it's just the mean of this posterior distribution, which is just this expression, which we covered in the previous slide. So it's very simple. So, so if we want to apply this trick here, so we have, we have two components to this distribution. The first part is that the probability of xi, this is just, as I said, you have multinomial, you have many observations come from this multinomial. So the probability that the, the word xij come from topic k, it's just the prior bt over uh, the sum of the prior beta, shifted by the observation, which is how many times I have seen uh, with the word w coming from topic t, okay? Uh, I'm sorry, this should be equal t as well. Sorry about that. Uh, this should equal t, then uh, just like how likely it is to observe the word given topic t, it's just as I get, it's just the mean of the posterior of epsi, and this is just the prior times the observation, this is how many words uh, have been assigned to topic t, t, and you can get this by just looking at over the z's and see like how many words are, uh, are assigned to uh, topic t, and here's like how many words are assigned to topic t, okay? So this is just multi the posterior distribution over c over epsi. The other part is that coming from uh, this distribution, which is again, uh, it's uh, the mean of uh, the posterior of, uh, uh, the posterior of over theta, and this again is the threshold distribution, and the mean here is the prior, which is how likely to see alpha t in general, and you add to it, you shift it is by how many times you already have seen uh, topic t in this document, okay? So again, Taking the mass aside, this is actually very intuitive. If I want to assign a word in a document to a topic T, I need to ask two questions. How likely it is for the word to be generated from topic T, and how likely it is for topic T to be assigned to that document, okay? Just very simple. And each of one of them takes the same form, but it's just a prior plus some statistic about how I observe it, uh, all the other uh, words without, without the variable which I'm sampling in. Is, is this clear to everyone? Okay. So again, intuitively, 
I have two components. How likely is, is the word to get from topic T? And how likely is topic T to appear in the document? It's just two sufficient statistics. Okay? And you just do collapse Gibbs sampler where you go over the collection one at a time. Uh, you fix uh, all the topic indicator and just sample. You get a probability distribution. So you compute this for topic T, and then you repeat this from T equal one to uh, the number of topics. You have a multinomial distribution. You sample from it. You, you flip. Uh, the topic assignment for uh, for this word, and you continue cyclically through, through the data until you converge. And that's actually very fast. This is much faster than the run collapsed version, which actually no one uses, of course. Okay, so so based on this equation, this is an easy algorithm. Uh, you just have, like as I said before, for Gibbs sampling, you have like thousand of iteration over the corpus. Uh, for each document, for each word in the document. Uh, you compute the posterior of the topic uh, using the previous equation, and then you sample, and then you update uh, two sufficient statistics. Uh, we keep sufficient statistic in the document and in the topic. So if you see here, we have the sufficient, the sufficient statistic are uh, how likely each topic in the document and how likely each word in the topic. And you keep this updated. So if you change the topic assignment for a given word, you need to update these two things. And this is also what you need to keep. And uh, so you update the local document topic table, and then you update the global world topic table. Okay? I say it's local because that only depends on the document, and this is uh, global because uh, it actually shared across documents. Okay? But uh, this algorithm actually is serial because Gibbs, uh, in general, is a sequential algorithm. You have to fix everything, sample one. Uh, one variable at a time, and actually that kills parallelism. There is no parallelism. You can't parallelize that. Okay. So in order to parallelize that, we need to introduce some approximation, and that's what I will talk about now. Okay. So before going topic model back, uh, I just want to abstract the problem a little bit by looking at again back at the clustering, because it exposes all the aspects of the problem in an easy way, and then we'll go back to topic model and see how we do it. Okay, so back to clustering, you have, we can divide the node in the graphical model into three types. You have the data, which is XI, you have the cluster ID, and you have the cluster distribution, which is a mean, for example, if you have a Gaussian distribution. We call this the local state, and we call this the global state. Okay, why? Because these variables, the i only uh, makes sense in the context of a given data point. Okay? But the cluster mu j is shared across all data points. Okay? And that's why we call this local variable and we call this global, global state. Okay? And this will actually be very important uh, in everything we do throughout the, today. So the global state is actually too big to fit in a single machine. Uh, local state is still too big. Because, for example, if you have uh, one billion data point, each data point brings a single variable, you still have one, one billion variable. But the good thing is only local. You need to only look at it when you touch a given point. But the global state is too big and it's still important. You have to look at all the global state for every data point. That's a very important distinction. So this like local and global division in the graphical model is not only applied to clustering, it still applies to topic models. And this is our graphical model. So we still have uh, the prior distribution uh, over the topic is still a global state. And uh, you have uh, the topic distribution over the world is still a global state because that's shared across all documents. Uh, the data is just our world, and then the local state is just a topic assignment for each word. Okay? And again, that also applies when you have some temporal models. So we have three problems okay, that we need to address. The first problem is that uh, local state, which is a cluster assignment in this case for each data point, is just still does not fit in memory because you might have like 100 billion examples. You can't put Z in memory. But actually, this is not a problem because we can stream this from disk. So I can keep the data in disk, and for each data point, I store the corresponding class label with the data point. And when I want to process data point in the Gibbs sampler, I just load the data and the local state of this data from disk, process it, and write it back. So that's easy. So I can deal with it. So you don't have to put all the variables in the graphical model in memory. Okay? 
The second problem is that the global state is too big, and we break this problem into two parts. The first part is that we say like the data is too big, so we stream it from disk and we partition it over machines. So each machine gets a subset of the data. And now the, uh, the global state is too big, but again, each we partition the local state again across machines, and now we want to synchronize the global state given each machine. So each machine has its own notion of the global state, but this notion needs to be synchronized, and we need to talk about, uh, we need to design how can actually make sure that all the client or all the machine uh, agree about what are the set of clusters and their distribution. And the third problem is that, as we said before, is that the global state doesn't fit into memory, but when you partition the data, you only need a partial view of the global state because you need the global state, the part of the global state which is required to process the data assigned to a given client. Okay? So these are our three design principles, is that once we divide the problem into global and local, we divide the local state across machines, we stream this from disk so we don't have to store Z in memory. And now once you have this division, you only need to have a partial view of the global state which is required to process your local examples. And since this partial state will overlap, so we need to synchronize across machines. And we need to talk about what are the protocols that we synchronize uh, uh, this global state across machines. Okay. So the most important thing again here is, is this last two blocks. The first one is very easy, as I said. So how we uh, synchronize a global state. So we don't want to, so there are a couple of algorithms. So back to our MapReduce framework how we can use this into MapReduce. So the first phase is that uh, we fix the global state, okay? And each member will take uh, a bunch of data points. It compute the new cluster assignment and it spits out uh, the sufficient statistic for, uh, the global, for the global state. And once you have one pass over the data, you collect the sufficient statistic and then you update the global state and then you iterate again. Okay? That's very bad. That looks like EM if you are familiar with EM, right? And we know that EM converges slowly. So we want actually our synchronization to be uh, lock free so that we don't have to lock anything. And we want to be fault tolerant and we only need to store the local data. So again, back to our abstraction. The idea here that we introduce is that again, we have the global state, data, local state. We partition the local state, we partition the example across different processor. So each processor or each machine gets part of the data, okay? And it just needs to handle this data. And then you have the global state, but each processor has a replication, has a copy of the part of the global state which is required to process the example assigned to it, okay? And as you notice here, we don't put this an arrow because it's not an arrow in a dependence kind of sense, just a replication, just an approximation. So we made a copy, a local copy of the global state and now each client or each processor go about changing the state of the eye, changing its local replica, but we wanna make sure that the local and the global are synchronized with each other. Okay, so it's very simple. Okay, so uh, here is just an abstraction of the communication topology. So you have the global state resident in one machine and you have different client or different replica of the global state, this is the local copies. And now each processor streams the data from disk, look at XI and ZI, look at its own local copy and change its own uh, replica of the global state, okay? But we wanna make sure that these replicas are synchronized by pushing update back and forth from the global state, okay? And we want this to be happen asynchronously so that we don't lock. And uh, in this architecture, if you have 10 machines, if you have 10 replica, 10, 10, 10 like uh, you have a cluster of 10 machine or so, that's okay. But if you have like 5,000 machine and you wanna do that, that would be a bad idea, so you can have a hierarchy over that. So you can have a uh, global state, you can have a local replica inside each rack, and then you have different machine, so that you don't overload the global communication by, uh, by talking to only a single node. Okay, that's just a, a generalization. We'll just focus here today. Okay, so how we can turn on that? What's the protocol? What do we need to do? So here is, uh, the basic idea is that it's, uh, so the synchronization protocol is a variant of message busing. Uh, all this happened asynchronously. So what happened here is that uh, you have two messages. You send messages from local to global, and you send messages from the global state to the local replica. Okay, so again, as I said, 
each processor has a local copy. It has its own examples. Uh, it reads the local copy and updates the local copy. Okay. But each client, it also maintain something called XOLD. And XOLD means what is the last value I know about the global state. Okay. So I start with XOLD equal X. Okay. And now once I process the example, the value of X keeps changing because I change the assignment of the topic. So I use a sufficient statistic of my local replica changes from the old one. Okay. And now asynchronously, while you are processing the data, you want to synchronize your copy with the global. So what you say, okay, what is the difference? What is the delta from the last time I talked to the global state? So you compute this delta. Okay. And now you send this delta to the global. And once the global get this delta, this is the change in the global state which have not been propagated yet to the, to the global. It just, all what it does, it just takes the global state and fold the in delta using a plus operation. And the plus operation here depends on the nature of x. So if x is counts, plus is just plus. Uh, if x is other, uh, a billion groups, these have different meaning. But let's focus the in counts. So it takes the delta, let's say we have a count, how many times the word appear in each topics. I send my delta. And then once the global state gets it, just applies delta to, uh, to the global to a count, okay? And then it replies back by telling you, okay? And then I set my x all to x. Now I see, okay, now I think that I have sent my delta. So if, if, if no one else have changed the global state, then the global state should be equal x, right? If I'm the only processor that changed the global state, then if I send delta, then I expect the global state to be equal x now. But this is not the case because there are another replicas which are sending changes while you have been processing. So once the global state receives the delta, it applies it, okay? And then it sends back from global to local, it sends back the current value of the global state. And now the local copy, let's say this one for example, now it's saying this is the last time I heard from the global state and this is my current value, I think, okay, I get, this is the current value of the global state, this is my, my last estimate, then the global state must have changed it by this delta. And this change should be attributed to what have been happening to in the other clients, okay? So I say, okay, this is the delta, which is added by the remaining client, then I need to update my local copy by this difference, and, ne and now I need to set my x all to be equal to the global state, okay? So again, let's summarize, because it's a little bit, uh, Confusing if you haven't seen it before. So the idea here is that each, each, each client has a replica and it just proceeds as if from a, from a sampling point of view, it's not aware of the global, it just changed the local replica. Okay? And all what happened is that from the local to global, I change the delta, how, uh, what is the difference between, uh, and delta, this delta is just like how many changes I have added to the state and haven't sent to the global one. And once I, the global state receives this delta, just to update x global with delta. Okay? Now, the global, will it send back to delta? Because now the global state gets delta from everyone. So now I need, if this node, for example, sends its own delta, the global state needs to send what was happening in the remaining ones to this node, and so on to the remaining ones. So the global state will send x global to the local copy. Now the local copy say, okay, this is x global minus x, so this must be the delta which has been added by the remaining client, so I add it to my local my local replica, and now register that, I think that the global state now will be x equal x old. Okay, and so on. And this one is asynchronous, it's happening in the background while you are assembling your distribution. Okay, yeah. Good, that's very, very good questions, okay? I'll come to this, okay? So you understand now what's happening, okay? So the, the question which have been asked here is actually a very good question, which means that, uh, let's say, uh, you have an element of the global state. Let's say, for example, you have a topic word count, okay? That means that for some time, each uh, local copy and the global copy have different notion about how many times the word art appear in topic one, right? And does this actually cause conversion problem because the value will change abruptly? Uh, it doesn't here because if you have, and this is actually a very good thing about big data. Uh, if the global state have a value, let's say, 1 million, and your local copy have a value of, say, 1 million and 1,000, and some other copies have 999,900. So that if, if all the differences between the local and the global are smaller compared to the global value, 
then if you take this, and as you see here, the change in the probability distribution because of the difference is actually very small. Okay? So if you compute, this, if, if the sum, let's say for this one, this is the one that, this is the local state, this is the global state, by the way, the count, the topic word count. So if like the global here is like one million, and one replica has this count as one million and ten, okay? And if the word in this topic has, for example, 100K or 1,000, and one topic, one, one replica has it like at 1,005, the change of the, the bound of the probability distribution, uh, the probability value is actually small. The change is small, okay? So the way that this works is that because the variable depends on each other via aggregate, and that's why this works, okay? If you depend on each other via configuration, that doesn't work, and it calls exclusion. Okay, is, is this point clear? So the difference between the counts is actually small. It's actually bound because you are synchronizing quickly in the background. So the effect, the net effect change in the probability distribution is actually much more smaller than that. And that's why, that's why it's okay because you are sampling anyway. Which actually, based on this question, it tells us that the rate of convergence, how frequent, how, how, uh, how fast you can converge, depends on how fast you can synchronize the state between the local and the global. So you want an efficient network bandwidth consumption, otherwise uh, the local copy will diverge from the global state. Okay, so you want to balance this, this conversion. Okay, is, does anyone have any question until now? Just intuitively, everything is not clear, not definitely in the mesh, just the intuition's idea. Okay, so I go back to a bit of system issues that appear here because as I said, as our friends say here, it's great, it works, but it can go wrong in many ways, okay? And in order to make this doesn't go wrong, you need to make sure that you have an efficient using of the bandwidth so that you can synchronize very quickly. Okay. So here, for all of my talk, I have been saying that, uh, let's say, go back to LDA, and in this case, a global state will be the worst topic count, so if you have, Thousand topics, million words, this is huge, huge, huge matrix, okay? So if you store this in a given single machine, now you will have a bottleneck, right? So in this case, you need to distribute uh, uh, the global state into a set of servers, okay? And in this case, uh, from the local replica, when you wanna send the update of a given copy, you need to know where this copy lives, where it lives in which server. And one way of doing that is called consistent hashing, which means that you evaluate a half hash function on the key, the key of, uh, that you want to synchronize, and the machine, and you take the minimum uh, of this hash function. So this will be the machine, which is assigned to uh, key, key, key x. Okay? And the idea of consistent hashing uh, is to have a very nice property. Uh, if a server fails, okay, everyone will go a different server, like uh, dynamically, Without communication, uh, all the client dynamically will agree about which server is addressing, is containing the value x. Even if we add a new server or remove servers, we, I don't have to tell the client anything. They will know automatically uh, what is the key server assigned, okay? So the intuition about this distribution is that I wanna make sure that uh, uh, I have a bunch of server and I distribute the global state across the server. So otherwise, you will have a bottleneck and synchronization will be very slow. And in order to know for each client what is the server assigned to a given key, you apply this hash function to all uh, X and M and take the minimum, and this will be the server that assigned to, key, to X. And this decision is consistent because it's uh, meaning that it's uh, reproducible, which means that each machine can uh, arrive at the same decision independently. Okay, so uh, uh, in this case, if you have uh, uh, K machines, then the storage of the global state uh, in each machine is order one over K which is really good because as I said before, we need to deal with fault tolerant. So in this case, uh, an easy way to fault tolerant is that we can just snapshot, uh, each server can snapshot its image, uh, which is only order one over K, and you can do that in parallel, so I don't have to block for a server to take a snapshot. And, uh, but the bad thing is that each machine uh, need to open K connections. So uh, it's really, really bad because you don't know which word, uh, which machine have each key. So you wanna make sure that you have a connection to all the servers, and when you wanna synchronize a given key, you wanna see, okay, which server have this key, and then you send a request to that server. 
And now the throughput bear one machine is one over k because you are uh, dividing your throughput across the across connections. And as I said, uh, our assumption here is that uh, the number of client and number of server are the same. Okay, so this one here, make sure that this client talk to remaining servers and so on. So if you aggregate them, uh, you get the ring again. You get the bandwidth again. Everyone is talking to everyone. Okay. So there is some efficient consideration here. Uh, what is the protocol of synchronization? So let's say, let's say for a given client, you have a bunch of keys. Okay, and now I have a set of servers. And as we said, we want to send the message for the global state. So here's the global state. And this is one local state. So I have a bunch of keys. And as we said before, each key mapped to a given server. And you have a bunch of servers. So the question now is that what is uh, uh, what is the protocol? Uh, how I can send? So one idea is that I go sequentially over my key. I ask this key belong to that server. Then I send to that server, and you receive a message. Now I go to the second key, and now this key is in this server. So you go to that server, and so on. Okay, and this is actually bad. Why bad? Because I need to maintain, at every time, I need to maintain connection to all the servers. Another thing, why this is bad? Because there's an overhead of sending any message to a server. So if you only send one key to a given server, that's bad, because now you don't have an efficient utilization of the bandwidth. Okay? So another idea here, so that's what, what we uh, get by this abstraction, is that we say, okay, here is a client, and here is a server. And I want to see, like, uh, how should I communicate? How should I schedule sending keys to server? So we maintain that. Another idea is that we say we, uh, we design, like we arrange the keys, such as that the keys that go to server one are here, the keys that go to server two are here, and so on. Okay? So we have a block. And now one, one thing we'll do is that we can say, OK, I pick so that block that go to server one, this is a block that go to server two, and this server three, and so on. And each client independently picks one random blocks and say, okay, I want to pick the uh, things that go to server one. So I take these old keys and just communicate to that server until I'm done sending all keys to that server. Okay? And once I'm finishing, I go pick another block that I haven't synchronized and connect to that server and send all keys. So at any given point in time, I'm only talking to one server. Okay? So collectively, this will look like this. If you take a snapshot, so each, each client have picked the server and takes a bunch of keys that goes to that server and send it to that server. That's one solution, right? Uh, what do you think here? Is it good or bad? What, what, what's, what's bad about this solution? So at a given snapshot, if I look at the system, this is a communication pattern. This guy is talking to this server, this guy is talking to this server, and so on. But what's the problem here that you observe? What is the inefficiency here? Yeah, someone talk. Huh? Not all servers are used. Exactly. So, so there are two things. One thing is that some servers are not used because it's a sample replacement. So there is non-zero probability that you get some servers that don't get any connection. And some servers are a bottleneck because there is some uh, hottest bot, like some servers will be con uh, have a communication with many clients. Okay? So I want to make sure that this doesn't happen. So the basic idea is this, instead of picking one random server to talk to, you can actually pick multiple servers. So in this case, I will say I select, uh, let's say R equals three. So in this client, I say I want to select three servers to talk to. Let's say I select server one, two, one, three, and four. So I open three connection, one to server one, one server three, and one to server four. And then I do a round robin over the key. I send some keys here, some keys here, some keys here until I finish this block. And when I'm done, I close this connection, and then I pick another four blocks and send them to the server. Okay? And in this case, you will have a better utilization because you won't get this problem, uh, which is inefficient because some servers are actually idle. Okay? And 
we have done some analysis about this, and we find that the efficiency, which is the efficiency of using the bandwidth, uh, is bounded from above and below by this equation. It's, it's just like a bit of algebraic manipulation. It's very simple. You can look at our paper for that. Uh, but this actually bound bandwidth on how many uh, server you communicate to uh, at a given point. And actually, in Berkeley, we found that if r equal 4, uh, that's just sufficient to saturate the bandwidth. So you don't have an idle servers, and you don't have an oversaturated servers. Okay? So again, we, we, this is a machine learning, but you still have to address this system. Because if you actually don't do these things, you have bad synchronization. Bad synchronization means bad conversion, meaning the value can, can go wrong. Yeah, questions? Oh, you will, and that's why you have a, a bound here. The efficiency will be, you have, this is the optimal efficiency. So the optimal efficiency is that you have some idle servers. Okay, and the idle server is like the server which doesn't get any, any communication. So if, if you, just the intuition is that if you, uh, everyone have our connection, then the probability the server is idle uh, is e to minus r. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> so this is the probability that uh, some servers are, are, are idle, assuming that the remaining server have an optimal. So you always, you must have some servers that's idle. Okay? But the more that you increase R, the more that you make this upper bound smaller. But if you increase R, we'll go back to the previous problem where you have inefficiency, so you need to balance the two together. Okay? So you have upper bound and lower bound, and we found in Berkeley that R4 is really good. So you can do, you, you write the lower and the upper, you find that R equal 4 is really good. Okay? And, uh, does anyone notice something weird about this equation? It doesn't depend on what? It doesn't depend on the number of servers. It's not me. OK. <laughs> okay. So it actually doesn't depend on the number of servers. It's very interesting. It just depends on how many active connections you keep, which means that you keep adding and removing server without affecting your, your bandwidth utilization. OK. 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 So we talk about how to synchronize the keys, what is the basic idea. Yes. <coughs> So, but then, by reducing, changing the number of servers, if you reduce them, then isn't your chances for a hash collision higher? Uh, changing for hash collision high, yeah, that's, that's a good question. So that's where we use uh, consistent hashing. Because you always have the key assignment just the minimum of this. So the more that you increase, the more you get a more uniform distribution. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. So we want to just like put this now into, into like how we can use this, all of this idea to build the system end to end. Uh, okay, so back to our sequential algorithm. Uh, the only machine learning part which we talked about today is a collapse Gibbs assembler. Uh, you have two sufficient statistics. Uh, one of them is local, which is a document topic. And this is a local state. You don't have to keep it in memory. You just keep it in disk with the data, with the words. And you have another sufficient statistics, which is global, which is the worst topic, and this is your global state. And uh, this is the one that actually that uh, uh, kills parallelism because it, you have to go sequentially into the topic assignment, change one of them, update the global state, and so on. Okay? So our proposed solution uh, is that uh, these things, it's a beer in single machine, in a given machine. So you have concurrently each CPU executes this building block. Right? And then uh, each machine have uh, a view of the words that appear in this machine. For example, if you divide the document into a given machine, and if you have five million words, probably each machine will only get a few numbers for like one machine will get one million, another machine get two million, and so on. So you only need to keep the keys, the word topic keys, which are required to process the words assigned to you. Okay? And that's what I mean by minimal view. And then you have continuously one thread uh, going through the data, reading the, uh, the local state, and changing its own local copy of the global state. And then you have a background thread that does the continuous communication in the background, which is thinking of making the, your local copy of the global state up to date with the global copy. OK? That's our guess. So, uh, so the architecture which we use is <clears throat> it's multi-core and multi-machine. and uh, uh, in, uh, we have two files in disk. One file has the words, and one file has, sorry, one file has the word, which is the token, and another file has the topics. And the reason we keep them separately is that this one doesn't change, but this one change. 
So you don't have to, if, if they are in the same file, you have to read the whole thing and write it back, but we don't want to have that, okay? So you have a file combiner, you combine these two, and now you push uh, the words and the topic into uh, the samplers, and you have as many samplers as you have threads in the local machine. And then uh, each sampler just uh, executes a collapsed equation, just the one line which I showed you earlier, and it generates some update to the global state and the local state. And now you have a single update thread that takes this update and uh, write back to the new topic file because this is a change and that's why you don't have to write the token because the token doesn't change and that's why we separate them. And in the, backgr and the, and the background you have update also to the global state. So that's the single machine version. For the multi-machine version, all what you need to add is that this will be this whole block will be here the assembler, which is uh, the cluster architecture will be a client. And in the server, we use something called ICE, and ICE is a uh, uh, distributed key value storage. As, as you said, all what we need to send is send back key values between the client and server. So there are some architectures that does this automatically for you. And in addition to the previous architecture, all what we need to add to go distributed is that we need to add a, an additional thread, an additional background thread that synchronizes your global, local state to the global state. Okay? <coughs> And that thread executes this, this logic which we talked about before. And as I said, we don't have, uh, ICE is not a single server, it's just a uh, multiple server. And we already know how we can distribute the keys into this server. Okay? But from an abstraction point of view, just each client needs to understand where each key appears and use consistent hashing for that. Okay. Uh, so this architecture actually is very easily extensible because for any graphical model, uh, for the machine learning part, you need to write your collapsed GIP assembler. And your collapsed GIP assembler will depend on local state and global state. So if you want to extend this architecture to work, for example, with uh, any gram language model, you need to add more, so more global state statistics. You need to have more key value pairs. Okay? And you just add them and synchronize them. Okay? So that's decouple the modeling bar from the synchronization. Uh, you can condition it inside information. As I said, there are like 1,000, like there's 100 of uh, extension to LDA, and most of them can be fit in this framework, where I, I, what, what I show you now is that given some sufficient statistics in terms of count, now you can synchronize and use this architecture. Okay? Uh, each model will just have different counts, that's all. And these numbers are a bit, uh, 2010, in the second part of the talk, I'll show some new numbers. Uh, so this number over uh, 8 million documents, this is just called the uh, PubMed data set. Uh, I told you that 8 million is actually no big data. Okay? But this is uh, the largest public available data set which people compare at. So we compare with this as well. And as you can see, uh, if we increase the number of machines, uh, here is a baseline architecture. This is a likelihood curve, how it changes. So uh, as you increase the number of iterations, the likelihood should increase, and it's saturated for some time where you converge. And as you can see, you expect that as you increase the number of machine, this is our curve, it should go faster actually. It should go sharper up because now you have more machines, 300, and go quicker. Okay? Uh, for the baseline, which actually uh, is an old system, uh, as you increase the number of machine, communication is not efficient, and that's why actually you slow down, which is actually very weird. You don't expect that. So the good, the good curve that you show is that as you increase the number of machine, you maintain the shape of the curve, but it, you should scale the curve slightly towards the y-axis, so you should go up quicker to your convergent value. Uh, maybe, sorry guys. Okay. Uh, and as I said, like we have like 10x faster synchronization, and just to give you an idea, the old architecture here, it, it just doesn't have a client server as we have, but just have the server is actually passive, it doesn't send back something, the client has to do all the work. It has to send the keys, and it has to go back and read the keys from the server. Uh, okay, so as I said, this is the first part. Uh, so I show you the data, hardware, I show you how you can do distributed latent variable models. If your sufficient statistic takes the form of counts. Uh, if your sufficient statistic does not take the form of count, we'll come to this in the second part of the talk. And uh, there are many models that we can build on top of that, which I will cover later, uh, like user profiling, multi-domain analysis, some situational literary analysis. Uh, if time permit, I'll talk about multitask learning, about computational advertising. 
And this te technique is actually very, uh, very generic. So I have like 10 minutes, I will cover this one and then we'll take a break and then come after that for the second question. So this astrophinous uh, global setting is actually shown in the model, right? I mean, it's a lot like some kind of structure, variation approximation we do assume that certain parts of you know, you're looking at kind of factorize in that sort of thing. Have you, have, you, have you thought about how, how the model looks like when you do this, these algorithmic changes, or in particular how the, how the error change? <coughs> I mean, you, you showed these points where not likely it increases, but when you do these kind of approximations, you, you overcome and you become more confident than you are, so. Yes, so all of these are, are actually correct. And as I show you, like the difference between the blue and red curve is just different synchronization strategies which tell you actually how important is synchronization. So if you actually don't synchronize fast, the error actually increases and you actually don't convert. And it's correct, sure, yeah, that's great. And there are some theoretical analysis that try to look at this error. So in practice, uh, we have worked on that, a couple of people also working on that. And what we observe in practice is that this diversion doesn't happen, okay? And some people try to analyze that theoretically uh, it's a group of people at UCI Irvine, uh, Alex Sehler, and uh, a couple of other author. Uh, I can send you a paper if you're interested. And uh, there is something called contraction property. And contraction means that the error doesn't uh, add to each other. It means it the error contracts, just bound it. So it, it's a bit more technical, but there is some work actually that shows uh, in, in this kind of uh, architecture, the error actually contracts. It doesn't, it doesn't uh, increase. Okay, so again, uh, if you just wrap up uh, all the tools, so it's the first part. So uh, we talk about distributed inference and latent variable models. Uh, the algorithm that we call, we call it star synchronization for the reasons that we have a star and the local and the global exchange message, uh, message over the star. Uh, we also call it delta aggregation because we send delta back and forth from the client and the server. Again, let's wrap up again. So this is our LDA. Uh, the, our global variables is phi, which is a topic distribution of our words, and our local variable are theta and z, we collapse theta. So what we have is that in order to sample z, we run a collapse Gibbs sampler, and we compute the probability of z equal k, given uh, that word i is equal w, and the other topic assignment, and we, see, we saw that this factor into two parts. One of them is how likely the topic is in the document, and the other one is how likely the word is in the topic, okay? We show that for this equation, the local state is uh, uh, the document topic count because that depends only on the given document that you are processing. And the global state is a word topic count because uh, that's shared across all the documents, okay? And what we have done is that we take this plate notation, we partition the document into multiple machines, okay? We still have alpha and phi shared across machine, we collapse, and now we put our global state in a server, okay, which is, we call it IS, and this global state here is just uh, the number of words in every topic and uh, the number of time each word appear in, in topic K, word W appear in topic K. And then we push a copy of the global state into each machine, this is a global state replica, and then you run your local inference updating the global replica, and in the background, we we'll synchronize the global replica, uh, the local replica with the global state. Okay, so it's very simple. Okay, that's just a big summary of what we have covered uh, in the first part. And if you have different models, you just have different statistics, and you use the same technique as long as your statistics are just counts. So that would work very well. Uh, okay, that's just a different topic models. We just give rise to different statistics, but the same architecture will apply. Uh, I, okay, so it's actually, so this asynchronous algorithm, is this all what we need in order to uh, do inference in any, gra any graphical model? And the answer is no, because we still need some synchronous operation. So if, for example, you think about, you wanna do parameter optimization, or you wanna do AM style algorithm, or if you have non-collapsed global variables, this doesn't work, okay? And to see why, uh, let's go back again to our LD example, and in this case, uh, we won't assume that alpha is fixed, but we want to optimize alpha. Okay? So now it's alpha is not counted. So we go into uh, EM style operation, where 
we run our asynchronous collapse assembler as before, fixing alpha. And now we need an M step to optimize alpha. So in order to optimize alpha, uh, we need to compute the sufficient statistics across all documents. And there is no way that you can do that asynchronously, at least in the current algorithm to optimize alpha. So what we do here is that we need to do a synchronous operation. Where, so here we are running asynchronously. We move one pass over the data. We apply our previous algorithm, and we stop. And then we need to compute some sufficient statistics based on uh, the topic distribution inside each document, uh, aggregate these uh, values across clients, and then take these values, optimize alpha, and push it back. Okay? So the architecture will look like that. So in the first stage, each client will sample these. Okay? And after that, it reaches a barrier. And in order to optimize alpha, it just writes some sufficient statistic which is needed to optimize alpha, okay? which is just like uh, how many, it, it, it depends on like uh, how many unique topic appear in each document for this case. And uh, I think in two days when we talk about Bayesian number metric, you'll, you'll talk about this thing is more. Some statistics, you compute it, and then you reach a barrier, and then you write this statistic to the global state. Okay? And now you reach a barrier, and then one of these clients, the remaining client will just waiting, and one of these clients will go and collect this statistic and sum them, and then change the current value of alpha to a new value, and write it back to the global state. And then we have another barrier, and then each client read alpha, and then that will finish one cycle. Okay? So that's another design pattern in case you want to optimize some of the parameter in your graphical model. Uh, and we'll actually come to this architecture in, in a couple of models that we'll discuss in the second part. Uh, and as you can see here, so what is the problem? What you, what's the problem that you can see with this architecture? What is the, uh, the efficiency that you can, you can think about? What, what can, can go wrong? So what's good about asynchronous? When I'm optimizing Z, there is no blocking. Everyone run in parallel, just go. So if there is no need to optimize alpha, I need to, that's all what I need. So everyone independently go over the data, independently go over the data, as there is no blocking. So life is good. But since I need to optimize global variables, I need to somehow slow down so that I collect some statistic and optimize it, okay? So what's the problem here? The problem here is that if one client is slower than the other, so when you reach, so the fast client will reach the barrier quicker, and it has to wait until the slow client finishes, okay? So the problem with synchronous uh, operation is that you are as fast as the slowest machine, okay? And that's why whenever possible, we would like to work with asynchronous operation, but sometimes you can't. Sometimes you have to do some synchronous operation. And I go, uh, in the second part, I'll tell you some models which require to have this pattern, and I'll show you another model which we, the standard algorithm is synchronous, but we still turn it into a synchronous algorithm and works very well in practice as well. And uh, I think I'll stop here because I don't have time to go over the next part. And uh, this is what we'll cover in the next part. We'll cover uh, some temporal model of user interest, some multi-domain user processorization, and also we'll cover, if some time happens, uh, some competition advertising and multi-task learning and how you can scale these things. Uh, and as I said, we'll try to see if we can actually get rid of this synchronization step in some of these models. Okay? Okay, any questions before we take a break? Yes? Uh, so, in reality these days, um, companies like Google and Yahoo use Gibbs sampling for their problems, is it? Is that true? Um, uh, I won't be here. I won't say yes or no, but I won't be here. I won't be talking about these things. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's, it's used. Because in research communities, it's kind of uh, criticized a lot. So that was, uh, uh, in what, in what? In research communities, yeah. it's criticized a lot. Sampling is. No, uh, yes, that, that's correct because uh, so sampling is criticized because it's slow, it takes some time to converge, but what I presented today is that we can apply these things to billions of documents, and I'll show you that in, in some of the application. And actually it scales very nicely with the number of machines. So if you have a huge number of machines, because the problem with sampling is sequential in nature, and we break that here, okay? The other thing is that uh, since it's sequential in nature, it doesn't take parallelism, it kills parallelism, but all what we have done here is that we break this. 
So it becomes actually asynchronous and doesn't block. You can scale, you can make the iteration time smaller uh, based on how many machines you have. Another thing is that good thing about sampling is that give you a sparse models, where uh, if you compute the word topic distribution, the topic word distribution, if you're using something like variational inference, you have to, this would be a dense vector, and if you have five million uh, words, and if you have thousand topics, that would be huge. But the, the advantage of GIPS is that it's stored key value pair. So it only stores the key topic, the word topic count, which I've been in the corpus as well. Okay? The advantage of variational inference is that you have an objective function. So you can run it for a few iterations, but it's dense. And so, uh, new work that we have done and other people have done is to combine these two things. So you still have a sparse models, but you still have run variational inference on top of that so that you still have bound the number of iterations. Okay? So GIPS is good because now we can scale the iteration. Iteration will be small, but you still need many iterations. Okay? So we apply variation, combined variational inference with GIPS, we still have the sparseness properties which we like, but we reduce the number of iterations. Okay? So it's used and it's very fast. 